A History of Ancient Israel, Lecture 8, The Kingdom of Judah Until the Time of Sennacherib. In this lecture, we will focus in on the southern kingdom of Judah, which consistently found itself caught between mighty empires far to the north in Mesopotamia and far to the south in Egypt. We will take a look briefly at this southern kingdom up until the time of the Neo-Assyrian king Sennacherib, who came down in the year 701 BCE to spread terror and havoc during his campaigns in Judah, eventually destroying the city of Lachish and threatening Jerusalem itself. Let's backtrack then to the time of Rehoboam, who came to the throne when he was 41 years old, following the death of Solomon. Rehoboam rules for 17 full years in Judah, we don't have many details about his reign except an account of his actions in connection with the northern rebellion, that is, where the northern kingdom of Israel split off from the southern kingdom of Judah, as well as an account of his actions in connection with Shishak's invasion from Egypt, and a note that there was constant warfare between Israel and Judah, that is, between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Now, the time between Solomon's death in about 930 BCE and the Babylonian conquest in 586 BCE is the period that we refer to as the divided monarchy or the divided kingdoms. This is a period of 350 years, which are treated largely by the Bible as a period of moral decline and religious laxity. The history of Israel is dealt with in a fairly cursory manner, and the history of Judah fares only a little bit better. Throughout the telling of the stories of Israel and Judah in the biblical narrative, there is no question that the Bible clearly considers Israel and Judah to be sister states, that is, two branches that share the same ethnic, cultural, and religious roots, and that they had emerged from some sort of larger Israelite kingdom. Residents of both kingdoms worshipped the same God, spoke a similar language, and wrote using the same script. But the latest archaeological data doesn't fit this picture particularly well. There are differences in everything from the pottery traditions in the two different kingdoms to the architectural styles found in Israel and in Judah. All of this is influenced by the fact that Israel and Judah, although they were fairly close to each other geographically, still had different climates and very different topographies. Pottery traditions changed much more slowly in Judah, in part because Judah lay off the beaten track of the main trade routes, and it was these trade routes that brought new styles, new techniques, and new technology to the northern kingdom of Israel, which did lie astride the main trade routes. The northern kingdom of Israel, the kings there built significantly more monumental architecture. Down in the southern kingdom of Judah, things were different. Israel's rulers were looking for ways to impress and intimidate their subjects, in part because they are in contact with the other kingdoms across the ancient Near East. Even at the height of its power, the southern kingdom of Judah never commanded the economic resources or even the population that was necessary to pursue grandiose architectural projects. In many respects, Israel's sister states were not Judah, but rather Ammon and Moab across the Jordan River. In culture and political development, settlement patterns and climate, Judah has more in common with Edom across the river in southern Jordan than it did with Israel lying to the north. So there has been a new series of questions which have emerged in recent years among scholars and archaeologists concerning the portrayal of the divided kingdoms, just as they are questioning the Bible's portrayal of the united monarchy, so they are questioning its portrayal of the divided kingdoms as well. This is a critical time in the ancient Middle East. National boundaries were being decided. Archaeology is helping to reconstruct the jockeying for power that was taking place throughout the region. There are numerous military powers of that day, 
and people like Ahab and Omri in Israel had to deal with them. So did the kings in the southern kingdom of Judah, but only a little bit later. Israel develops into a full-blown state already in the 9th century BCE. Judah only follows in the 8th century BCE. That is, it looks as if Judah is behind Israel. And indeed, it's only when the kingdom of Israel collapses and falls in the year 720 BCE that Judah really takes off. In part, it may have been because refugees from the northern kingdom of Israel fled south to Judah and settled there, bringing technology, architecture, and everything else down to the southern kingdom. So recent investigations has led many scholars to conclude that there's a gap of about a century and a half, about 150 years, between the time that Israel became a full-fledged state and the time that Judah became a full-fledged state, or kingdom, if you will. We have other clues that Israel became a state earlier than did Judah. Wine and olive oil production, various other things, all indicate that Israel was ahead of Judah. Nevertheless, once Israel collapses, Judah takes off in part because there is no real competition anymore. Until recently, most biblical archaeologists took the biblical description of Judah and Israel at face value. They showed Judah as being a fully developed state as early as the time of Solomon. But now, recent evidence collected together and published by Israel Finkelstein and Neil Asher Silverman in their book, The Bible Unearthed, claims that the supposed evidence may have been no more than wishful thinking and that all the things that we attributed to Solomon should now be downdated by a century or more. Finkelstein, Silverman, and other archaeologists now argue that the early kings of Judah were not the equal of the northern kings of Israel and that we should be looking at these areas in a very different way. They argue that not a single trace of literary activity has been found in the 10th century or even down in the 9th century and that monumental inscriptions and personal objects with names of individuals appear in Judah only 200 years after the time of Solomon, that is, in the late 8th century BCE. Up until then, everything is happening up in Israel, and it's only 200 years after the time of Solomon that Judah takes off. Here, too, archaeological surveys come into the picture, and they indicate that until the 8th century, the population of the highlands, that is the hills in Judah, was about one-tenth of the population found in the similar highlands up in the north. That is, the population of Israel may well have been ten times the population of Judah. And indeed, if we recall the distribution of the twelve tribes of Israel, as they're called, ten of the tribes are up in the north, and only two of the tribes are down south. So we might not be at all surprised at the evidence that archaeological surveys are showing now that the population of the northern kingdom of Israel may have been ten times the population of the southern kingdom of Judah. It's now clear that Judah really never enjoyed a golden age after the time of Solomon and that it underwent a long and gradual development over hundreds of years. So for most of the first 200 years that the northern kingdom of Israel was in existence, Judah remained in the shadows. It had rather limited economic potential. It was relatively isolated, geographically speaking, and it was tradition-bound, at least in comparison to the northern kingdom of Israel. But with the rise of the Neo-Assyrians over in Mesopotamia and their attacks on the northern kingdom of Israel, Judah begins to expand and to become more important. In the year 734 
BCE, we get a rather complex political situation. The king of Israel is a man by the name of Pekka, or Pekka, P-E-K-A-H. The king of Aram, that is Damascus in Syria, by the name of Rezin, the two of them conspire to attack Judah and to lay siege to Jerusalem. The king in Jerusalem at that time is a man by the name of Ahaz, or Ahaz. He, threatened by the king of Israel and the king of Aram, turns in desperation to Tiglath-Pileser III, the Neo-Assyrian king who had already attacked the northern kingdom of Israel. He turned to the Neo-Assyrians for assistance and emptied out the treasury of the temple in Jerusalem in order to pay the necessary bribe. The bribe or perhaps the tribute that continued to be paid subsequently, is recorded in a building inscription of Tiglath-Pileser III, which simply reads, In all the countries which I received the tribute of, Metinti of Ashkelon, Jehoahaz of Judah, and then he goes on to name other people as well. So we see that there are complex political maneuverings in the ancient Near East, already by 734 BCE. Now, after the year 720 BCE, with the conquest of Samaria, the capital city of Israel, and with the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel itself, Judah found itself surrounded by Neo-Assyrian provinces and Neo-Assyrian vassals. And that new situation was going to have implications for the future that were almost too vast to contemplate. The royal citadel of Jerusalem is transformed in a single generation from the seat of what was really a rather insignificant local dynasty into the political and religious nerve center of a regional power, both because of its dramatic internal developments and because thousands of refugees from the conquered kingdom of Israel fled to the south. Now here, archaeology has been able to chart the pace and the scale of Jerusalem's sudden expansion. Excavations conducted in Jerusalem in recent decades have shown that suddenly, at the end of the 8th century BCE, that is, after the time of 720, Jerusalem underwent an unprecedented population explosion. There's no other way to put it. A population explosion. Its residential areas expanded from the former narrow ridge on the east, that is the city of David and where Solomon had built, to cover the entire western ridge as well. All of the sudden, the city doubles in size, at the very least. A defensive wall, a very formidable defensive wall, is constructed to include these new suburbs. That's the best way to put it. In a matter of decades, that is, within a single generation, Jerusalem goes from a modest highland town of about 10 or 12 acres in size to a huge urban area of 150 acres. That is, from 10 acres to 150 acres of close, densely packed houses, workshops, and public buildings. In demographic terms, the city's population may have increased as much as 15 times from about 1,000 to 15,000 inhabitants. Finkelstein and Silverman, in their book, The Bible on Earth, go on to provide more details. And they state that a similar picture of tremendous population growth emerges from the archaeological surveys that have been conducted outside Jerusalem, that is, in its hinterland. In the districts to the south of the capital city, what used to be relatively empty countryside is now filled up with new farming settlements, both large and small. What had been sleepy little villages now become real towns for the first time. Lahish, for example, way to the south in the Shefala, is a good example as well. Until the 8th century, Lahish was a relatively modest town. Then, Sometime after about 720, it is surrounded by a formidable wall and transferred into a major administrative center. Indeed, it becomes the second most important city 
in Judah. So the expansion is astounding. The population is now huge. The population of Judah, which had long hovered at just a couple 10,000s, 10,000, 10, 20,000, 30,000, suddenly grew to about 120,000 people, a veritable explosion. Now this is all in the wake of Assyria's campaigns to the north when they destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. So Judah experiences not only very sudden demographic growth, but also a real social evolution. It finally becomes a full-fledged state or kingdom. But this does not happen until this late period in the 8th century. All of a sudden we get archaeological indications of state formation, monumental inscriptions, seals and seal impressions, that is, with individuals' names on them, marking private property, ostraca, royal inscriptions for the administration, ashlar masonry and stone capitals used on public buildings, mass production of pottery vessels, other crafts and central workshops, and distribution throughout the countryside. And then we get middle-sized towns, serving as regional capitals, and large-scale industries in oil, olive oil, and wine pressing, which shifted from local private production to state industry. All of these and more, Finkelstein and Silverman have pointed to as evidence for a new development in Judah, and have used this to argue the fact that everything that had come before was nothing, and that Judah comes into its own only in the late 8th century BCE after the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel. What they have presented, at least to me, seems to be fairly convincing evidence. There is also a new evidence of burial customs which emerges at this time, which suggests that there is a new elite in the social structure. We get the beginnings of elaborate tombs that are cut into the rock of the ridges surrounding the city of Jerusalem. Many of these are extremely elaborate tombs with ceilings and architectural elements, and there is no doubt that these are being used for the burials of the noble class and high public officials. The question is, where did all the wealth and the apparent movement towards full state formation come from? The inescapable conclusion, Finkelstein and Silverman argue, is that Judah suddenly cooperated with and even became integrated into the economy of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. King Ahaz of Judah had already started cooperating with the Neo-Assyrians. We saw that with his treaty back earlier in 734 BCE, uh, but the most dramatic changes came after the collapse of the northern kingdom of Israel. Wealth begins accumulating in Judah, especially in Jerusalem. The kingdom's diplomatic and economic policies are determined here, and the institutions of the nation are controlled from the capital city. So Jerusalem becomes the administrative and religious capital of a powerful kingdom. It did not happen right after the death of Solomon. It happens 200 years later, when the kingdom of Judah is awakened from a 200-year-long sleep and enters into a period of exceptional growth and prosperity. Its population had swelled from the influx of refugees that were fleeing the devastated northern kingdom of Israel, and yet the transformation of Jerusalem from a sleepy capital of a quiet backwater to the central city of a regional powerhouse wasn't particularly easy, because it was surrounded by vassal states and provinces of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And the last decades of the 8th century BCE saw Judah having to cooperate with that great empire, and its cooperation alternated with periods of defiance. In the year 708 BCE, Judah saw a chance to break free from the Neo-Assyrian grip. The powerful King Sargon II died, leaving his throne to a young, untested son named Sennacherib. The Neo-Assyrian Empire at this time was preoccupied with troubles off to the east. And so the king of Jerusalem, the king of Judah, a man named Hezekiah, 
thought that this might be a good time to rebel. He tried to play off the two great empires of the day, Egypt to the south and Assyria to the north. He tried to play them off against each other. It did not particularly work very well. We are told in the book of 2 Kings that Hezekiah rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. However, this rebellion was not to be successful. In these early years of Sennacherib, who came to the throne in 705 BCE, Hezekiah participated in a widespread revolt against Assyrian rule. He withheld the payment of his tribute to Assyria. The revolt was well planned and was quickly suppressed by Sennacherib and the Neo-Assyrians in the year 701 BCE. We have a lot of information concerning this revolt from biblical sources, non-biblical sources, and archaeology as well. This rebellion is quite familiar to readers of the Bible, but they may not be as familiar with the story from extra-biblical evidence and from archaeology. The account of Sennacherib's campaign is given to us in the second book of Kings and the second book of Chronicles, as well as in Sennacherib's own account. We are given the story of the confrontation between Sennacherib and Hezekiah. It seems that Jerusalem is surrounded, and an Assyrian general speaking for his king addresses the people and offers them two options, basically surrender or die. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. Do not let Hezekiah make you rely on God, says the general. If the people throw down their weapons, he adds, they will be allowed to live and then deported from Jerusalem away to a land like your own land. The Assyrian general's arrogance stirs Hezekiah to pray and to ask for divine assistance in defending Jerusalem. According to the book of Isaiah, an angel of God is sent out that very night and kills 185,000 Assyrians. And when the people of Jerusalem awake the next morning, it's to a city filled with the dead bodies of Assyrian soldiers. Sennacherib, the Bible tells us, retreats back to his capital, Nineveh, where he is subsequently killed by his sons while praying. Well, there's a lot more to the story that can be told, and we can tell it from a couple of different aspects. For one, let's take a look, first of all, at one of Sennacherib's own inscriptions, the so-called prism. The six-sided prism of Sennacherib reads as follows in his own words, As for Hezekiah the Judean, who had not submitted to my yoke, I besieged forty-six of his fortified walled cities and surrounding small towns which were without number. Using packed-down ramps and by applying battering rams, infantry attacks by mines, breaches, and siege machines, I conquered them. I took out 200,150 people, young and old, male and female, horses, mules, donkeys, camels, cattle and sheep without number, and I counted them as spoil. Himself, Hezekiah, I locked him up within Jerusalem, his royal city, like a bird in a cage. I surrounded him with earthworks and made it unthinkable for him to exit by the city gate. His cities, which I had despoiled, I cut off from his land and gave them to Metinti, king of Ashdod, to Padi, king of Ekron, and to Silibel, the king of Gaza, and thus diminished his land. I imposed upon him, in addition to the former tribute, yearly payment of dues and gifts for my lordship. Now this sounds an awful lot like the account that we've got in the book of Second Kings from the Bible. 2 Kings 18 says, In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. And the king of Assyria required of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorpost, which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlain and gave it to the king of Assyria. 
And the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rabsaris, and the Rabshakeh with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. When they arrived, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is on the highway to the Fuller's Field. A similar story is told in the book of Second Chronicles by the chronicler in the Hebrew Bible. And we are told as follows. After these things and these acts of faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah and encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them for himself. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and intended to fight against Jerusalem, he planned with his officers and his mighty men to stop the water of the springs that were outside the city, and they helped him. A great many people were gathered, and they stopped all the springs and the brook that flowed through the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? He set to work resolutely and built up all the wall that was broken down and raised towers upon it, and outside it he built another wall, and he strengthened the Milo in the city of David. He also made weapons and shields in abundance. Hezekiah closed the upper outlet of the waters of Gihon and directed them down to the west side of the city of David. Thus says the account in the book of Second Chronicles. In Second Kings it continues, the rest of the deeds of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made the pool of Siloam and the conduit and brought water into the city. Are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Now what we have here is the description of the so-called Hezekiah's Tunnel, which appears to have been dug in Jerusalem at this time, in part to bring the water in from the Gihon Spring right into the middle of the city. And Ecclesiasticus says Hezekiah fortified a city, bringing water within the walls. He drilled through the rock with tools of iron and made cisterns for the water. The Assyrian attack on Jerusalem was no surprise to Hezekiah. He clearly saw it coming. According to Sennacherib's own records, the Assyrians conquered 46 cities in Judah before ever proceeding to attack Jerusalem. Jerusalem was well protected, though, so Sennacherib decided to subdue the city by siege. Hezekiah had no doubt prepared for the siege by laying in vast stores of food, but water presented a more difficult problem. The city's water supply, the Gihon Spring, lay outside the city, down near the floor of the Kidron Valley. Hezekiah solved this problem by building a fantastic tunnel, just like the earlier water tunnels at Megiddo and Hatsor, which led under the city from the spring to a pool. This pool was known as the Siloam Pool, on the other side of town. Hezekiah's tunnel was dug through 1,750 feet of solid rock, and it is a remarkable engineering achievement. Two teams of diggers started, one from either end, and following a path somehow managed to meet in the middle. To this day, we're not sure how they did it, although James Michener thinks that he figured it out and has a chapter in his book, The Source, describing it. But the fact does remain, as the Bible tells us in Second Chronicles, Hezekiah closed the upper outlet of the waters of Gihon and directed them down to the west side of the city of David, as we have already said. Sennacherib's siege of the city was ultimately unsuccessful, perhaps due in part to the building of this tunnel. Hezekiah's tunnel was rediscovered in the year 1838 by the American explorer and biblical scholar Edward Robinson, who crawled through the tunnel, even though at that point it was largely silted up. Then, in 1880, some boys who were swimming in the tunnel near the Siloam Pool discovered a now-famous inscription, which was soon thereafter chiseled out of the rock by thieves, broken into pieces, and sold on the black market. Today it is in the collection of the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. This inscription tells the story of how the tunnel was dug, and it commemorates the completion of the tunnel. It reads as follows, starting halfway through a sentence. Breakthrough, period. And this was the account of the breakthrough. 
while the laborers were still working with their picks, each toward the other, and while there were still three cubits to be broken through, the voice of each was heard calling to the other, because there was, and we're not sure what this word is, perhaps a crack or a split or an overlap, because there was an overlap in the rock to the south and the north, they could hear each other calling. And at the moment of the breakthrough, the laborers struck each toward the other, pick against pick. Then the water flowed from the spring to the pool for 1,200 cubits. And the height of the rock above the heads of the laborers was 100 cubits. So this is an amazing story of engineering done almost 3,000 years ago. And it is a story that ranks right up there with the biblical story of Hezekiah's triumph, the ultimate triumph, where God strikes down the Neo-Assyrian army and 185,000 people die in a single night. Exactly what took place there, bubonic plague, black death, we don't know, but still we can combine the archaeology with the biblical account and conclude that Sennacherib was not able to capture Jerusalem in 701 BCE. Indeed, what probably happened is that he was bribed and released Jerusalem from the siege as long as it guaranteed to continue paying tribute every year. The other major city that Sennacherib attacked in 701 BCE is the city of Lachish, which was the second most important city in Judah. Unlike Jerusalem, however, Lachish was not able to hold out and was attacked and destroyed by Sennacherib in that year of 701 BCE. And here we've got no fewer than four separate and independent accounts of the destruction and capture of Lachish. First, we have the biblical account. Secondly, we have an account by Sennacherib himself. Third, we have an account in pictures, which Sennacherib put up in his palace back at Nineveh. And fourth, we have the archaeological evidence. Lachish was the scene of excavations for many years, directed in large part by David Yushishkin of Tel Aviv University, and it has now been published in its entirety. We know from the archaeology that the Assyrians mounted their siege of the city from the southwest, which makes sense topographically. They built a large ramp, an Assyrian siege ramp, up which they could push their uh, war engines. Inside the city, at precisely this point, the Judeans defending the city built a counter ramp, and archaeology has discovered both the Assyrian siege ramp and the Judean counter ramp. Also discovered in the archaeological excavations are numerous remains of these final battles to capture the city. Back at Nineveh, Sennacherib's capital city, we have the Battle of Lachish depicted in what must be the closest thing to an ancient movie. Scene after scene carved into stone, beginning with the phalanxes of infantry marching towards the battle and ending with the deportation of the conquered Judeans. These reliefs were found in Sennacherib's palace without a rival at Nineveh in what is now modern-day Iraq. We can tell by looking at these reliefs and by reading the descriptions that Lachish ultimately fell and that the defenders were deported or killed and that Lachish, the second most important city in Judah, fell. It was after the capture of Lachish that Sennacherib made his way up to Jerusalem, but Jerusalem, in turn, did not fall. What we have instead is Jerusalem paying a bribe to Sennacherib, as we have already mentioned, and is allowed to continue as the capital city of the kingdom of Judah. However, this would not be the last time that Jerusalem came under attack from a foreign power, and in fact, the days of Jerusalem and the kingdom of Judah were numbered. It would not last more than another century at the most. We will see in the next lecture, Jerusalem 
and the kingdom of Judah coming under attack from the new empire in the region, that is the Neo-Babylonians, and what happens when the Judeans revolt against Nebuchadnezzar. This ends Lecture 8. A History of Ancient Israel, Lecture 9, Neo-Babylonians and the End of the Kingdom of Judah. In this lecture, we'll be taking a look at the end of the southern kingdom of Judah. Judah rises to great prominence in the 7th century BCE after its northern neighbor, the kingdom of Israel, has been destroyed by the Neo-Assyrians. Unfortunately for Judah, they themselves are going to come to an end not much more than a century later when another mighty empire from Mesopotamia embarks on its own campaign of expansion. These are the Neo-Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar and the Neo-Babylonians destroy Jerusalem not once but twice, burning the Temple of Solomon to the ground and exiling the leading citizens of Jerusalem and Judah to the faraway city of Babylon. Before we get there, however, let's take a look at the reign of Josiah. Josiah is one of the last major kings of Judah. He is one of the last descendants from the house of David to rule independently in Judah. And he, by himself, attempts reforms that will take Judah back to the grand days of David and Solomon. Now, one thing we have to realize is that during this period, towards the end of the 7th century BCE, Judah is a minor player, a little player on a huge stage, which is dominated by the three great Near Eastern powers of the day, namely Assyria, Babylon, and Egypt. Judah itself is a contested periphery during the last decades of the 7th century and into the first decades of the 6th century BCE. That is, it is on the periphery of the Assyrian Empire, it is on the periphery of the Babylonian Empire, and it is on the periphery of the Egyptian Empire. All three areas thought that they could claim Judah, and all three are willing to fight over it. This was not a good time to be a king of Judah. Of the last five independent kings descended from the house of David, two meet their deaths in direct connection with international struggles, and the other three die in foreign exile. Let's turn to the reign of Josiah first. He came to the throne of Judah in the year 639 BCE. He was all of eight years old. Halfway through his reign, he began a series of far-reaching reforms when a scroll of laws was found in the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. Now, there is some question as to what the scroll of laws was. The thinking now is that it was probably a copy of the book of Deuteronomy. But we're also wondering if it was really discovered rather than planted. Josiah had realized that the people of Judah had strayed from where they should have been, and so he implemented sweeping religious and political reforms. He was able to do this based upon the discovery of the scroll in the temple, which showed what they should be doing as opposed to what they were actually doing. So in implementing these sweeping religious and political reforms, Josiah is trying to become another David. Now, along with these reforms, the political and religious, Josiah also was actively involved in expanding Judah's territory up to the north, and in doing so, he annexed the capital city of Samaria, which had been the former capital of the kingdom of Israel, and he also annexed Megiddo and the Jezreel Valley. He was trying to put Judah on a road that would take it back to the greatness of the United Monarchy, which had been fully 300 years earlier. Unfortunately, Josiah ran into some problems. Namely, he ran into the Egyptians. Pharaoh Necho II of Egypt kills Josiah. And when Josiah dies, his dreams for a Judean renaissance, if we can put it that way, were buried with him. Now, Josiah is killed at Megiddo in the Jezreel Valley in the year 609 BCE. 
He has been on the throne for approximately 30 years, so this would make him about 38 years old at that time. And for many people who study ancient history and ancient religion, the meeting of Josiah and Necho II is considered the most significant of the battles that took place in the Jezreel Valley. On the surface, reconstructing what happened is pretty easy. We are told the events in the book of 2 Kings, as well as in the book of 2 Chronicles, and then there is also a recounting by Josephus. Now, if we reconstruct the events by combining all of the available sources, it seems that things proceeded as follows. In the spring or the summer of 609, Necho II of Egypt and his army are heading northward up to the city of Carchemish. They are coming to the aid of their ally, the Assyrians, and the two of them will fight against their common foe, the Babylonians, who are on the rise at this point. So it's going to be the Egyptians and the Assyrians against the Babylonians. The battle is going to be fought up at Carchemish in northern Syria, and Necho's army had to traverse the length of Judah in order to get there. So he simply asked permission from Josiah for his army to march through the kingdom of Judah en route to northern Syria. For some reason, and we don't know exactly why, Josiah said no. He refused the Egyptians' permission to march through his lands, and instead he marched with his army up to the Jezreel Valley and waited for the Egyptian army there. When the Egyptians came into the Jezreel Valley, they found the Judean army waiting. Josiah climbed into his chariot, drove up and down in front of his army, uh, encouraging the men. He sounded the attack and prepared to watch. But just as the battle got underway, however, an Egyptian archer let fly with his arrow and hit Josiah, either killing him outright or at the very least mortally wounding him. So either dead or dying, Josiah is transported out of the battle, taken south to Jerusalem where he is buried, along with his dreams for a rejuvenated Judah. Well, it's all very well and nice, except, of course, for poor Josiah, but there are grave problems with this uh, reconstruction. The major stumbling block is that each of our sources gives a different account as to what actually happened. And although we know that Josiah was killed at Megiddo, the question is, did he die while actually fighting, or was he murdered there before the battle actually took place? We don't know for sure. And uh, I will not go into the details here. You can go to my book, The Battles of Armageddon, if you're interested. What I would simply say, though, is we probably have to follow the account in Second Kings, which simply says, when Necho met Josiah at Megiddo, he killed him. End of story. The chronicler embellishes upon this, as does Josephus a couple hundred years later. But I think we'll go with the shortest account, which simply says that when Necho saw Josiah, he killed him there. It probably took place before the battle, if there was even a battle in the first place. Nevertheless, with the death of Josiah then, Judah begins to suffer a period of tremendous turbulence. And we see Judah caught between the great powers, namely Assyria, Babylon, and Egypt. Now, by the time we get to the period of 605 BCE, we've got Nebuchadnezzar and the Neo-Babylonians emerging as the prime power in this region. And Judah is going to be under the thumb of the Neo-Babylonians for about the next 20 years, if not beyond. I say the next 20 years because in 586 we get the destruction of Jerusalem, but even then the Neo-Babylonians continue to rule Judah, or what remains of it, right down until 539 BCE. So overall, we will see about 70 years of Neo-Babylonian domination over Judah. Now, in comparison with other periods, the written source material for this time period is quite abundant. We have, for this period of Neo-Babylonian domination, both biblical text and non-biblical text. The biblical text are found in the books of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, as well as in some of the books of the prophets, such as Jeremiah and Ezekiel. 
The book of Jeremiah especially gives us some important information on this period. But we also have something from Babylon itself. These are the so-called Babylonian Chronicles. They are not a single document, but actually rather a genre of literature. They are presenting to us selective summaries of royal reigns, probably based on year-by-year -year records of events that were kept in Babylon. Only portions of these survive, but they include coverage of the years from 616 until 594 BCE, and in particular we have uh, events from a number of the years from Nebuchadnezzar. And it is from these so-called Babylonian chronicles that we can determine the exact dates when Nebuchadnezzar captures Jerusalem, namely 597 and 586 BCE. Nebuchadnezzar comes to the throne of the Neo-Babylonians in 605 BCE and will rule for the next 43 years, down until the year 562. One of the first things he does is expand his empire to the south, namely down into Judah and beyond. We know that he comes down and destroys the cities of Ashkelon and perhaps Ekron in the year 604. And then in 601, he again fights against the Egyptians. Once again, the Egyptians are led by Necho II. So just as in the earlier battle at Carchemish, nearly a decade previously, now we've got the Neo-Babylonians and the Egyptians fighting, this time without the Assyrians because they have shuffled off the mortal coil and are no longer a player on the major stage. As far as we can tell from the Babylonian Chronicles, which are the primary source of information for this battle between the Egyptians and the Babylonians in 601, neither side was able to claim victory. It seems to have been a draw with heavy casualties on both sides, and both sides withdrew from the battlefield to recover and regroup. At this time, in 601, the king of Judah is a man named Jehoiakim. He seems to have been a fairly faithful vassal of the Neo-Babylonians since he had come to the throne a couple years before in 604. We get this information from both the Hebrew Bible and the Babylonian Chronicles. However, it seems that in 601, after Nebuchadnezzar and the Neo-Babylonians failed to conquer Egypt outright, that Jehoiakim saw this as probably a sign of weakness and so he withheld the tribute that he was supposed to pay to the Neo-Babylonians. Now, he was probably also rather pro-Egyptian in his leanings because it seems that he had come to the throne of Judah with the help of the Egyptians rather than with the newly arrived Neo-Babylonians. In any event, withholding tribute from the Neo-Babylonians is never a good idea, and Jehoiakim is going to pay the price. Now, Nebuchadnezzar retreats back to Babylon after 601 when he fails to defeat the Egyptians. He takes two or three years to get his army back up to full strength, and then he takes off again for Judah. And his purpose here is to bring his rebellious vassal, namely Jehoiakim, back under his thumb. We are told what happens next in great detail by the Jewish general turned Roman historian Josephus, who's writing about 600 years after the actual events take place. Nevertheless, he seems to be relatively accurate in his account. And what he tells us is that Nebuchadnezzar attacks Jerusalem in the year 598 and puts Jehoiakim to death for rebelling and for failing to pay tribute. He also exiled many of the leading citizens of the city or put them to death. And Josephus describes exactly what happens in great detail. Let me read you briefly what he says in his book, Antiquities of the Jews. Josephus says, The king of Babylon made an expedition against Jehoiakim. When he, Nebuchadnezzar, had come into the city, he did not observe the covenant he had made, but he slew such as were in the flower of their age, and such as were of the greatest dignity, together with their king Jehoiakim, whom he commanded to be thrown before the walls without any burial, and made his son Jehoiachin king of the country and of the city. He also took of the principal persons in dignity for captives, three thousand in number, and led them away to Babylon, 
among which was the prophet Ezekiel, who was then but young. And this was the end of King Jehoiakim, when he had lived thirty-six years, and of them reigned eleven. But Jehoiachin succeeded him in the kingdom, and he reigned three months and ten days. So even though Josephus is writing this about six centuries after the events happened, he seems to be pretty accurate because the Bible gives us a similar account, although a little bit more ambiguous. So what we're told is that after Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem in 598, he took away 3,000 people into exile in Babylon, including the prophet Ezekiel. This is the first of what will be no fewer than four deportations. All told, this becomes known as the Babylonian exile, in which the leading people of Jerusalem are taken away as captives to Babylon. The worst, though, was yet to come, because Nebuchadnezzar is going to lay siege to Jerusalem at least twice more, namely in 597 and again in 586. So when Jehoiakim is killed, his uh, son, Jehoiachin, a very similar name, but one ends in K-I-M and the other ends in C-H-I-N in English, his son Jehoiachin becomes the king of Judah. Now, Jehoiachin at this time is either 8 or 18 years old. We're not exactly sure. The numbers in the accounts are a little bit difficult to interpret. The one thing that we know for sure is that he was king for a very short time, even by the standards of Judah at that point. Josephus tells us that he rules just about three months, and it indeed seems to be the case. Somewhere around the middle of March in the year 597, Nebuchadnezzar comes back to Judah, and we are told the events by three separate sources, namely the Babylonian Chronicles, the Bible, and Josephus. Now, this is nice because in addition to the Bible, then we have this external, the extra-biblical account from the Babylonian Chronicles, which we can use. Josephus, we might want to take with a little grain of salt because he is writing so much later and because he probably also is using the biblical account to a certain degree. But at the very least, we've got the Bible and the Babylonian Chronicles. And so in the Babylonian Chronicles, we are told in the seventh year, the month of Kislev, the king of Akkad mustered his army and marched to Syro-Palestine. So in the seventh year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, he is marching to Judah once again. And the Babylonian Chronicles continue. They say, he, that is Nebuchadnezzar, encamped against the city of Judah, and on the second day of the month of Adar, he captured the city and seized its king. A king of his own choice he appointed in the city, and taking vast tribute, he brought it back to Babylon. Now this recording of the exact date for the capture of Jerusalem, the second day of the month of Adar, which we would see as the 16th of March, 597 BCE, is extremely unusual. They usually didn't record an exact date, and it probably reflects the importance of the conquest of Jerusalem. The campaign from start to finish lasted no more than three months, and this includes the time it would have taken to march from Babylon to Jerusalem, which probably took them about two months to do, about eight weeks. If so, the city gave in after a siege, which lasted no longer than about a month total. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, we're told of this capture of Jerusalem, but we're not given any details of the siege itself. The biblical account simply says that Nebuchadnezzar himself arrived after the siege was already underway. In the book of Second Kings, it says, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it, and Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, gave himself up to the king of Babylon and his mother and his servants and his princes and his palace officials. The king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign and carried off all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold in the temple of the Lord which Solomon, king of Israel, had made as the Lord had foretold. The biblical account also tells us that in addition to the king Jehoiachin, Nebuchadnezzar also carried away into exile some 10,000 captives from the conquered city. 
The one thing that is not mentioned is the Ark of the Covenant. As we have discussed in a previous lecture, Nebuchadnezzar nowhere makes mention of the Ark of the Covenant, leading us to believe that it had already disappeared, been destroyed, or melted down in some way or form prior to the capture of Jerusalem. After this, after 597, Nebuchadnezzar installs a new king on the throne of Judah to be his puppet king. This is a man by the name of Zedekiah. He is a brother of the former king Jehoiakim, and he is a son of the king Josiah. So he is royalty, but he is installed on the throne of Judah as a puppet king. Nebuchadnezzar probably hoped that Zedekiah would obey him, and indeed, Zedekiah did this at least for the first few years of his rule. But just like his predecessors, eventually he too is going to rebel. And just as they had done, he misjudged the power of the Neo-Babylonians and would pay the price for his rebellion. We don't have the Babylonian Chronicles as a source for Zedekiah's rebellion because they break off after Nebuchadnezzar's 11th year of rule in about 594 or 593 BCE. So we have to put all of our reliance on the biblical account and on the later commentary by Josephus for the story of Zedekiah's rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar in 586. However, taking the place of the Babylonian Chronicles is a new source in this particular instance, namely archaeology, because we have archaeological evidence for the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BCE. We are told that Nebuchadnezzar came down on the tenth day of the tenth month in Zedekiah's ninth year of rule. This would be equivalent to about January 15th in 587 BCE. We have three nearly identical accounts in the Bible which depict the story of this campaign, and then we've got Josephus' history written several centuries later as well. We are told that as Nebuchadnezzar's army swept down from Jerusalem, that they destroyed the cities of Judah one by one. And indeed, archaeological evidence found at a number of different cities in Judah agree with this. We have houses with uh, burnt walls, toppled over, fallen as if they've been destroyed by siege engines. Lachish seems to be destroyed once again. And then it comes to be Jerusalem's turn. Josephus tells us that the siege of Jerusalem lasts a total of 18 months this time. Either they had managed to put the walls back up or they had learned some better tactics because rather than just withstanding for one to three months, as had happened back in 597, now they're able to last for 18 months. Both Josephus and the biblical accounts agree, though, that the siege ended about July 18th in 586 BCE. This is the ninth day of the fourth month of Zedekiah's 11th year of rule. The biblical accounts, as well as Josephus, give us some details of this assault. The siege tactics were the standard ones that were used by the Neo-Babylonians everywhere, and indeed were the same ones that had been used by the Neo-Assyrians earlier. Josephus says, for example, in the Antiquities of the Jews, Now the king of Babylon was very intent and earnest upon the siege of Jerusalem. He erected towers upon great banks of earth, and from them repelled those that stood upon the walls. He also made a great number of such banks around the whole city, whose height was equal to those walls. And this siege they endured for eighteen months, until they were destroyed by the famine, and by the darts which the enemy threw at them from the towers. So Josephus gives us a detail of what happened there. The biblical account agrees that they built siege ramps and uh, a dike to surround the city, and that it was only after a breach had been made in the fortification walls surrounding Jerusalem that Nebuchadnezzar and his army were able to enter the city. The inhabitants had been reduced by famine and disease, and they offered little resistance. The archaeology of the city, excavated after 1967, particularly in the what's called the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem, shows that the biblical accounts and Josephus were correct in what happened. 
There are ruins, ash, burnt wood, and destructions toppled over walls that remain from the houses that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed. You can see these in the archaeological record. There are also arrowheads, Neo-Babylonian arrowheads specifically, found in the destruction of these houses from this exact date. The inhabitants who were suffering from famine and disease at this time offered very little resistance to the invaders. We are told in the book of Second Kings that on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. And the book of Lamentations tells us the hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became their food in the destruction of the daughter of my people. So lamentation seems to imply that the famine was so severe that the people are even eating their own children. That is, they are reduced to cannibalism. Now here, archaeology plays a rather interesting role because in the excavations in the city of Jerusalem, the archaeologists have found no fewer than three toilets. And one of the toilets, when they lifted up the lid, they were able to excavate the material, shall we say, that was within the toilet. Looking at the feces underneath a microscope, the archaeologists were able to determine a number of things. One is that the people of Jerusalem in 586 were not eating what we would have expected. They were not eating wheat or barley or the other grains. Instead, they were eating what we would call backyard plants, mustard grass, dandelions, weeds that you usually see growing in your backyard. Here they are not picking them and throwing them away. They are picking them and eating them. But the archaeologist also found something interesting when looking at these remains under the microscope. Namely that the inhabitants of Jerusalem using this toilet were suffering from parasites, specifically from tapeworm and from whipworm. Now tapeworm and whipworm are parasites that you get when you are living in unsanitary conditions. That is, you're not washing your hands properly or you're using polluted water or in some cases that you are watering your plants with water that's, uh, again, not sanitary, or even fertilizing it using human remains rather than some other kind of fertilizer. And also, there is evidence then from this tapeworm and whipworm that they were not cooking their meat properly. That is, you get these parasites when your beef or pork is not cooked properly. Since we're in Jerusalem, I would presume they were cooking beef rather than pork, but nevertheless, it looks like we have A, a lack of firewood, and B, a lack of proper water. When you add to this the fact that they're eating backyard plants rather than real food, it definitely gives you a picture of a town under siege, and one that had been under siege for a number of months. Fortunately, the one thing that was not found in this toilet were any human remains. That is, lamentation seems to have been exaggerating to a certain extent, and the people of Jerusalem, or at least the ones using this toilet, had not been reduced to eating their children, which is at least some sort of good news. Now, the biblical accounts tell us that Zedekiah fled from Jerusalem under the cover of darkness, but that he was caught near Jericho and was brought before Nebuchadnezzar. He was condemned to be blinded, but first he was forced to witness the killing of his own sons. And having seen his sons killed before him, his eyes were then put out, so that their deaths was the last sight that he ever saw. Zedekiah is then bound in chains and is taken away as a prisoner into exile to Babylon, along with many of his leading citizens. It seems that there was a delay of approximately one month between the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the city and of the temple of Solomon. Some scholars have suggested that the Neo-Babylonians used this month to loot the city and to deport its inhabitants, as the biblical text reports. For example, in the book of Second Kings, we're told, in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the king, came to Jerusalem. 
and he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. And all the army of the Neo-Babylonians who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. We get similar accounts in the book of Second Chronicles and in the book of Jeremiah. There are some discrepancies in the biblical accounts as to when exactly these events took place, but the destruction of the temple is traditionally said to have taken place on the 9th of Av, that is, August 16th, in the year 586 BCE. Archaeology has confirmed that the destruction of the city was complete. There are no mansions or palaces that remain standing. The Temple of Solomon is destroyed. Its treasures are looted and carried off to Babylon. There is no more Temple of Solomon. The account in the book of Second Chronicles is brief and to the point. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he, Nebuchadnezzar, brought back to Babylon. The description in the book of Second Kings is a bit more detailed, but it says essentially the same thing. Now, considering that Nebuchadnezzar had attacked and besieged Jerusalem several times during his reign, it's not surprising that he finally dealt decisively with the city and burnt the city to the ground. This is probably not impulsive revenge, and indeed some scholars say that the destruction of Jerusalem and of the Temple of Solomon was a calculated act with political goals, and the idea was to remove the House of David from government after they had proved disloyal time and again. The immediate results of the Babylonian conquest are clear. Most of the country was destroyed by the foreign invaders, and many of the leading citizens were led off into exile. We will spend the next lecture taking a look briefly at the events which occurred during the Babylonian exile and then when the leading citizens of Jerusalem were allowed to come back home to Judah and what exactly happened to them during the following Persian and Greek periods. After listening to Lecture 9, a student posed this question to Professor Klein. What is the story behind Josiah's murder? The story of the death of Josiah is a fascinating murder mystery. I go into detail in it in my book, The Battles of Armageddon, but let me briefly recapitulate what we've got here. We have essentially eyewitness accounts of what happened, but like a, a modern-day crime scene, each of the accounts from the eyewitnesses differs slightly. For example, in the book of Second Kings, it says, In his day, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the king of Assyria, to the river Euphrates. King Josiah went to meet him, and Pharaoh Necho slew him at Megiddo when he saw him. His servants carried him dead in a chariot from Megiddo, brought him to Jerusalem, and buried him in his own tomb. In comparison, we have a longer account found in the book of Second Chronicles, which says as follows. After all this, when Josiah had set the temple in order, King Necho of Egypt went up to fight at Carchemish on the Euphrates, and Josiah went out against him. But Necho sent envoys to him, saying, What have I to do with you, king of Judah? I am not coming against you today, but against the house with which I am at war. And God has commanded me to hurry. See, supposing God, who is with me, so that he will not destroy you. But Josiah would not turn away from him, but disguised himself in order to fight with him. He did not listen to the words of Necho from the mouth of God, but joined battle in the plain of Megiddo. The archers shot King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am badly wounded. So his servants took him out of the chariot and carried him in a second chariot and brought him to Jerusalem. There he died and was buried in the tombs of his ancestors. All Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. And it goes on, but that's the gist of it. Now, where did the chronicler get this longer and more detailed version of the story? It's perhaps possible that he made use of some of the details that are in the book of Jeremiah, but it's also possible that he had access to another set of documents that provided him with additional details, but which are now lost to us. 
There would be no reason to doubt the chronicler's more detailed version of events in which Josiah is killed during the battle rather than before it, except for the fact that it can be pretty easily shown that the chronicler embellished or exaggerated other stories that are found elsewhere in his narrative. And in fact, several of his stories sound strangely similar to episodes that occurred several hundred years earlier. So we might not want to take the chronicler at face value. In any event, what matters most for us is that Josiah is killed at Megiddo, however it happened, whether it was before the battle or during the battle, really doesn't matter, because when he died, his uh, Judean renaissance, his reforms, all of his attempts at getting back to a kingdom reminiscent of David and Solomon died with him, and in fact were buried with him. This is the end of Judah as we know it. The kings that come after Josiah are all puppet kings that are placed there on the throne by either Egypt or Babylon. This ends Lecture 9. A History of Ancient Israel, Lecture 10, Persians and Greeks in Judea. In this lecture, we will begin with a brief account of the Babylonian exile and then move to the periods of Persian domination followed by Greek domination of the land and end up with the establishment of the independent Hasmonean kingdom by the Maccabees. The immediate results of the conquest of Judah by the Neo-Babylonians are pretty clear. Much of the country was destroyed by the foreign invaders, as we have said, and the archaeology agrees with the accounts found in the Bible and elsewhere. What we're told also is that while a fair number of the uh, leading citizens were killed off, that even more were taken away and led into exile. We are told in the book of Second Kings, and I quote, and the rest of the people who are left in the city and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon, together with the rest of the multitude, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile. He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia. And this is indeed exactly what happened. So the exile in Babylon lasts for about 50 years. It's only 50 years, in a way, from 586 to 539 BCE, but it had an enormous impact, not only in the history of the Jewish people, but also on the evolution of religious thought and other things for the Western world. For example, it's during this period, this 50-year period, that the Pentateuch and the Deuteronomistic history of the Hebrew Bible were probably edited into their final form, and we get religious practices that evolved into what was going to become Second Temple Judaism and ultimately even early Christianity. Now, in terms of the exile and the deportation, it takes place in four different phases. We have deportations in the years 598, 597, 586, and 582. All told, it looks like there are just under 15,000 people who are taken off to Babylon. We've got about 3,000 in 598, 10,000 in 597, just under 1,000 in 586, and then about 745 in the year 582. For instance, the book of Jeremiah for 582 says, and I quote, in the 23rd year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive of the Jews 745 persons. Now, there's no reason to doubt such an accurate number. Overall, if you add together the four deportations, we get 14,600 Judeans. Now, it may be that as many as 20,000 people were actually deported, Scholars have estimated that there were probably about 75,000 people living in Judah at the time that the Neo-Babylonians invaded, including about 15,000 people in Jerusalem themselves. If this is accurate and 20,000 were taken off, that would mean that about 70% of the population still remained in Judah, even after the final set of deportations in 582. 
Nevertheless, people talk about the empty land. They claim that there was nobody living in Judah during the time of the Babylonian exile. This indeed seems to now be quite wrong. Even though the city and the country were devastated by the Neo-Babylonians, it does look like people stayed on the land. What we get here in the Babylonian exile is a case where a number of Jews are living outside the country of Judah. Not only do we have them in Babylon, but we also have people down in Egypt, for example. Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, goes off to Egypt rather than to Babylon, and we are told of correspondence that he keeps between the exiles that are taken off to Babylon and himself and his people down in Egypt. So we have, for example, Jeremiah down in Egypt, but we've got Ezekiel up in Babylon, and between these two prophets we get uh, a nice little account of what life was like outside of Judah at this time. There are also some non-biblical texts that shed light on the life and the status of the Jews living off in exile. We have, for example, among the Neo-Babylonian materials, some royal cuneiform texts that talk about Jehoiachin in exile. One text mentions rations that are given to him so that he can eat. And then numerous documents in Aramaic from Egypt give us evidence about the people living down in Egypt. The most significant of these are the so-called Elephantine papyri. These are documents that were found in the late 1800s at Elephantine Island, opposite Aswan in Egypt, and they came from a Jewish military settlement. The documents themselves present us with many of the legal and religious conditions that existed in this colony of Jews down in Egypt. Most of these documents date to the Persian period, that is in the 5th and 4th centuries BCE, but they can be used to reconstruct the life in Egypt during the Babylonian period because the community was already in existence at that time. Now, contrary to some understandings, the people that are living off in Babylon do not seem to have been living in terrible conditions. There uh, was no opposition to them or no limitation because of their religion or their origin. They were simply treated as were the exiles from any other nation. They were settled all over the place in Babylonia. They received land that they could farm, sites that they could rebuild and settle. They paid taxes. They served in the military, became involved in various commercial activities, could even own property and slaves, and occasionally even became quite wealthy. So the exile in Babylon was not necessarily that bad of an event, except, of course, that they were no longer living in Jerusalem and Judah. So they were relatively free. They certainly were not slaves. They would not have been under any pressure to assimilate, for example, and they were able to continue to practice their religion. Now, one thing to keep in mind in terms of the deportation and the people left behind We've got three sets of Jews now. One set has been deported off to Babylon. One set has fled into exile in Egypt. And one set has stayed behind in Judah. So we've got three distinct populations of Judeans. The elite were in Babylon. The lower classes had been left behind in Judah. And then there were those off in Egypt. So one question is going to remain, when the Jews are allowed to go back to Judah and Jerusalem, who are the so-called real Jews? Who's actually in charge? Are they the ones who were taken off to Babylon? Are they the people who had fled to Egypt? Or are they the ones who had stayed behind in Judah and never left? When we get to the middle years of the 6th century BCE, we get the rise of a new power in the ancient Near East. These are the Persians. They are going to quickly establish the largest Near Eastern empire that had ever existed until that time. The person behind the rise of the new empire is Cyrus the Great, Cyrus the Second. He is going to take over all the lands that have been previously occupied by the Neo-Assyrians and the Neo-Babylonians plus the Egyptians. 
For over 200 years, the Persians are going to be in charge of the area that we have been discussing, namely the lands which used to be the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. They are going to rule. The Persians will rule this area from the time that they capture Babylon in 539 until the time that Alexander the Great comes through in 332 BCE. So essentially, from our point of view, the people of Judah and Israel have traded one overlord for another. First, they had been under the thumb of the Neo-Assyrians, then under the domination of the Neo-Babylonians, and now they are under the control of the Persians. It will not end there, because from the Persians, they will go to the hands of the Greeks, and from there into the hands of the Romans, with only small interludes of independence in between. In September of 539, the Persians defeated the Babylonian army. Soon thereafter, the Persians take the city of Babylon. And we are told as follows in a text left to us from the Persians. On the 16th day, that would be October in 539 BCE, the army of Cyrus entered Babylon without a battle. On the 29th of October, Cyrus himself entered Babylon. There was peace in the city while Cyrus spoke his greeting to all of Babylon. With the capture of this capital city, Babylon, everything fell to the Persians. The Neo-Babylonians are no more. Hail to the new power, the Persians. Now, it is not an accident that history has remembered Cyrus as a great liberator. That is an image that both he and his officials sought to foster. Now, what he is doing in capturing the city of Babylon, Cyrus allows all of the people that have been taken prisoner and sent into exile by the Neo-Babylonians to go home. That is, he allows the Judeans to go back to Jerusalem. But it's not only them. All exiled people are allowed to go back home by Cyrus. So he is portrayed as the restorer of the gods and their sanctuaries. He's portrayed as the gatherer of the dispersed and is following in the footsteps of people like King Hammurabi of Babylon of more than a thousand years earlier. So he's got propaganda that he disseminates. He plays the role of the liberator. And from our point of view, he allows the Judeans to go back home. He, in fact, issues proclamations that allow the various groups to go back home. We are told specifically what he said in regard to the Judeans in the book of Ezra in the Bible, which contains two decrees dated to the so-called first year of Cyrus. This would be the year 539 BCE. It's not actually Cyrus's first name, but they're dating everything from his capture of the city of Babylon. And in these two decrees, it talks about returning the Judeans back to Jerusalem. Now, one is written in Aramaic. It's described as the official record of Cyrus's edict as preserved back in the royal archives in Persia. In this decree, he actually says that the temple in Jerusalem should be rebuilt, and he gives the dimensions and the specifications of what it should look like, says that royal money should be used for the project, and says that the vessels which had been stolen from the temple of Solomon and taken to Babylon should be sent back. So among other things, it says, in the first year of Cyrus the king, Cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt, the place where sacrifices are offered and burnt offerings are brought. Its height shall be 60 cubits and its breadth 60 cubits. With three courses of great stones and one course of timber, let the cost be paid from the royal treasury. And also let the gold and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that is in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, be restored and brought back to the temple which is in Jerusalem, each to its place. You shall put them back in the house of God. So we get the story then of the Jews returning back to Jerusalem. 
We are also given a second decree, this one written in Hebrew rather than Aramaic. We're told by Ezra that it was a decree that was distributed in writing throughout the entire kingdom. And we are told that Cyrus was charged by God to reconstruct the temple in Jerusalem. It also says permission is granted to anyone wishing to return to work on the rebuilding. In this decree, it reads as follows. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all of his people, May his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. So with this, Cyrus not only brings an end to the Babylonian exile, but allows the Judeans to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. This will become what we call the second temple. Here is when we run into problems, because when the exiles return back to Jerusalem, we have the situation of rival groups of Judeans, each thinking that they should be in charge. Eventually, after much squabbling, the temple is going to be completed and rededicated in about 515 BCE. So it takes more than 20 years to rebuild the temple. In the meantime, Cyrus had been killed in battle back in 530 BCE, had been succeeded by his son Cambyses. Cambyses invaded Egypt, added it to his empire in 525, and eventually then Darius comes to the throne of the Persian Empire. In the meantime, the people in Judah and Jerusalem have their temple once again approximately 70 years after the first one had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. During the Persian period, what had been the kingdoms of Israel and Judah are now part of the Persian Empire. They are one of the provinces ruled by a governor with a small court reporting back to the king in Persia, but for the most part, the Judeans seem to have been left on their own under Persian rule. It is during this period that the word Jews actually first comes into play, coming from Yehud, the Persian word for the Judeans. And so now we can actually refer to the people living in this region as Jews rather than Judeans or Israelites or Hebrews. Now, the period of Persian rule, as I've mentioned, lasts for about 200 years from the late 6th century down into the 4th century. It is a relatively quiet period for the Jews and for Jerusalem, but it comes to an end when Alexander the Great and the Greeks appear on the scene. This is going to take place in late in the 4th century BCE. Alexander conquers the Persians in a series of battles that take place between 334 and 323, and he takes control of most of the Persian Empire, including the province that they called Yehud, that is Judea, Judah and Israel. There are tales that say that Alexander visited Jerusalem. Josephus says Alexander, quote, when he had taken Gaza, made haste to go up to Jerusalem. When he went up into the temple, he offered sacrifice to God according to the high priest's direction and magnificently treated both the high priest and the priests. We've got similar stories in the Babylonian Talmud and elsewhere, but all of this seems to actually be apocryphal. It does not look like Alexander actually went to Jerusalem. Rather, after he had captured Gaza, he went directly down to Egypt and did not go off on a side trip to Jerusalem. Under Alexander, the Greek Empire eventually stretched across most of the ancient Near East. But when he died in 323, having named no successor, the empire collapsed and was split up among his generals. When Jerusalem and Judea came under Greek rule, 
this begins the period that we know of as the Hellenistic Age. It will last for approximately three centuries, from 323 until the year 30 BCE. This is a period which begins with Alexander's death in Babylon in 323, and it is a time characterized by upheaval. Alexander's successors are going to fight over his empire for the next 300 years. In part, we're going to see feuds between the Ptolemies in Egypt and the Seleucids in the Levant, that is, in the area of Israel and Judah. The Ptolemies in Egypt regarded Jerusalem and the surrounding territory as their own. The Seleucids in the ancient Near East regarded Jerusalem and its surrounding territory as their own. So once again, we have our area being a contested periphery. Jerusalem itself is going to be ground zero for more than 20 conflicts that take place during these 300 years. We need not go into detail on these battles. If you're interested, you can go read my book called Jerusalem Besieged. Let us skip down to the year about 167 BCE when a Seleucid king, one of the Greek kings, named Antiochus IV captures Jerusalem. Once he takes the city and its inhabitants, he orders parts of the city wall to be torn down, orders a new fortress called the Acra, A-K-R-A, to be built in which he installs a garrison of soldiers to keep the city in order, and he introduces a number of measures that are seen as fairly burdensome. In particular, Antiochus IV institutes a series of restrictions on Jewish religious practices. For example, he forbade ritual circumcision, he forbade the observance of the Sabbath, and he forbade the observance of various religious festivals. He also forced the Jews to eat pork, and to worship idols, namely representations of Greek gods. The people who did not obey were savagely beaten up or were killed. Some were strangled, others were crucified. And we're even told that Antiochus ordered his delegates to pollute the temple in Jerusalem and to call it the Temple of Olympian Zeus instead. Josephus, in his book Antiquities of the Jews, tells us that Antiochus placed an altar within the temple itself and killed pigs upon it, sacrificed pigs. Now, this is not something that you should do inside the temple in Jerusalem. Antiochus's motives were to civilize the Jews and to make them into good Greeks, but the Jews saw things differently. Following Antiochus IV's decrees and his pollution of the temple, we get what we now refer to as the Maccabean Rebellion. This is, plain and simple, a rebellion by the people of Judea against the Greek overlords. They want to push the Greeks out and take back their lands to form their own independent kingdoms. The story is found in the book of First and Second Maccabees. What we are told is that the rebellion starts up in about 167 BCE. It is a rebellion against Antiochus IV. And the incidents that set off the rebellion include the flogging of an old scribe by the name of Eliezer. He was flogged to death because he refused to eat pork. In another case, a mother and her seven young children were killed for refusing to worship a Greek idol. And in a third incident, two mothers who had just circumcised their newborn sons were driven through the city and then thrown to their deaths from the top of a large building. But the final straw came when Antiochus erected the altar to the pagan god Zeus in the temple. On the 25th of December in 168, Antiochus offered a pig to Zeus on this altar of God, and that was the final straw. The Jewish reaction was to rebel. This is the famous rebellion known as the Maccabean Revolt, a revolt which gives us the holiday of Hanukkah today. 
The story is well known to many people. Let me run through it very, very quickly, though, to refresh your memories. The Maccabean Rebellion begins in about 167 BCE, led by Judas Maccabeus from the family of Hasmon, that is Judas the Hammer. He leads the rebels. They fight against the Greeks a number of different times in four or five years. Eventually, they gain a peace treaty and get the prohibitions against the Jewish religious practices to be lifted. Included in this is the recapture of the temple and the rededication of it in December of 165-164. During the cleaning and dedication of the temple, they found a little thing of oil, which looked like it was only enough to light the flame of the great menorah for a single day, but miraculously it lasted for eight full days until more sacred oil could be found. And it is from this that today we celebrate Hanukkah and the Festival of Lights. With the successful Maccabean Rebellion, the Judeans, the Jews, are going to set up their own independent kingdom. However, it doesn't happen right away. It takes approximately 20 more years for the Hasmoneans to win their battle against the Greeks. And it's not until 142 that we get a new independent dynasty called the Hasmonean Kingdom, in which Jews are going to rule themselves as an independent kingdom for the first time in several centuries. This Hasmonean kingdom will last from about 142 down until 63 BCE, that is just under 100 years, and it comes to an abrupt end when the Romans, in the form of Pompey, Pompey the Great, come into Jerusalem in the year 63 and make all of Judah, Israel, and even Syria into a Roman province by the name of Palestina. The story of the Hasmonean Rebellion, the Maccabean Revolt, has been greatly simplified over the years and probably has nothing to do with what really happened. But we are told the events in 1 Maccabees, where it says as follows, Judah, the son who was called Maccabeus, took command. All of his brothers and all who had joined his father helped him. They gladly fought for Israel. He extended the glory of his people. Like a giant, he put on his breastplate. He girded on his armor of war and waged battles, protecting the host by his sword. He was like a lion in his deeds, like a lion's cub roaring for prey. He searched out and pursued the lawless. He burned those who troubled his people. Lawless men shrank back for fear of him. All the evildoers were confounded, and deliverance prospered by his hand. He went through the cities of Judah. He destroyed the ungodly out of the land. Thus he turned away wrath from Israel. He was renowned to the ends of the earth. He gathered in those who were perishing. We will not go through the details of the Maccabean Rebellion. Suffice it to say that most scholars agree that it was more than just a struggle for religious freedom. It was also a struggle for national liberation, as well as for political independence, and ultimately it became a struggle for the establishment of a free Jewish state. As a result, the Zionists in the 1800s, just about a century ago, very much liked to refer back to the Maccabees as the only successful rebellion in which an independent Jewish state had been set up, and they likened their work just about a hundred years ago to the events that took place during the Maccabean Rebellion. Thus, for example, Theodore Herzl, the father of modern Zionism, said at one point in this pamphlet called The Jewish State, Therefore I believe that a wondrous breed of Jews will spring up from the earth. The Maccabees will rise again. He said this in the year 1896. Jabotinsky, uh, a bit more warlike of a Zionist, agreed with Herzl. He said, yes, they have arisen, the children of those whose ancestor was Judah, a lion of the Maccabees. They have indeed arisen. And so we see the Maccabean rebellion being used 
in relatively modern propagandistic statements as incentive and precedent to establishing the state, the modern state of Israel. However, like all good things, it must come to an end eventually. And at one point, when we're down in the first century, we have uh, quarrels over the city of Jerusalem, as happened very frequently during its history. And Pompey, the great Roman general who happened to be in the area, was invited in to arbitrate the dispute. He ended up attacking Jerusalem, and then, once he had captured the city, committed a remarkable sacrilege when he entered the temple and the Holy of Holies. Josephus tells us that he saw, quote, all which was unlawful for any other men to see, but only the high priest, the golden table, the holy candlestick, the pouring vessels, and a great quantity of spices and 2,000 talents of sacred money. The Romans were in Judea to stay. The region soon became Roman territory, and it was eventually incorporated into the Roman province called Syria Palestina. This is where our name Palestine comes from, from the Roman name for its province of Syria Palestina. However, even then, it's going to take a while for the area to come under Roman rule. But in the end, when we take a look back at the Maccabean Rebellion, we can say that, yes, it was successful, but that the independent kingdom, which was established as a result of the rebellion, lasted just under a century. Now, this is going to be the only successful rebellion by the Jews against overlords. In the next lectures, we will look at the Roman inhabitation of this area and then eventually take a look at not one but two revolts by the Jews against the Romans, both of which ended in defeat and disaster.